Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Russell, and I'd like to thank my colleague Shandra Curtis, who also gave input uh, into this webinar. So we're both in the software development section at East EMWF, and I'm going to talk about visualization of East EMWF data. So just to get a little outline of what we're going to cover today, um, I'm going to talk about the different visualization systems that we uh, make available. These are EC Charts and MetView. So I'll just give a, a brief summary of EC Charts because it's not available to everyone. And then I'll spend more time talking about MetView, um, how to handle grid data, um, how to customize styling, looking at some different plotting algorithms and looking at when you might use one over another, and also how to import some of the nice predefined styles that we have um, that we can inherit from EC charts. Then a quick look at uh, buffered data for conventional observations, uh, scattered data, things like um, CSV files, um, data that you have from a Python script that you want to um, plot, a look at NetCDF data and ODB data, and then spend just a little bit of time looking at different uh, map projections, um, and then these different analysis views that we have, different ways of splicing your data, looking at um, cross sections and, and profiles and so on, and also how to combine all of these into a, into a single layout. Then I just want to say a few things about um, some of the scripting tools that we have available and also how to put our data into other Python tools as well. And then where to find out more. So just as a little uh, comparison between these two packages here, EC Charts runs in a web browser, whereas MetView is a desktop application. Uh, running on Unix systems. EC Charts supplies a predefined set of graphical products from our recent forecast. MetView is more general, let's say, um, so it provides post processing and visualization with any of our data, whether it's uh, recent or archived data or experimental data. Both systems use magics for their plotting engine. So that's why we're able to share graphical styles between them. And EC Charts has some restrictions on usage, whereas MetView is open source and anyone can run it. So just to give you that little overview of EC Charts. So it's designed for forecasters in particular. Um, so it shows you the, our recent uh, forecast products, as well as the web browser version that also has a WMS service as a web map service, uh, which means you can also embed its plots inside other applications um, that are WMS clients. But the important thing is that EC Charts is not available to everyone. Um, it has some restrictions on, on who can use it. It's for our member and cooperating states, forecasters, and for licensed subscribers. But since we can share some of these nice graphical products with MetView, it's worth just mentioning um, what EC Charts gives us. So EC Charts comes with um, hundreds of layers. A layer is defined as uh, data plus visual styling. And each layer has several different um, graphical styles available. In fact, I'm going to get a laser pointer here. So here what I'm highlighting then is the uh, style selection for a particular layer. Um, <clears throat> so users cannot fine tune the stylings um, of these products, but a lot of work and expertise has gone into the, the generation of these, so they should be pretty useful for most purposes. 
And then the other thing that EC Charts provides is some nice point inspection tools. You can <clears throat> you can click on a point and produce a time series or a meteogram or tachygram, for instance. So the forecaster provides a nice um, nice contained environment. Let's move to MetView now, just because it is um, open source and available to everyone. So it's designed more for researchers and operational analysts. It's running on Unix machines, and it can retrieve, manipulate, visualize, and examine meteorological data. You can use it interactively through its graphical user interface, and you can also use it purely through scripting, for instance, from Python or its built-in uh, macro scripting language. It's got a built-in Mars client. If you want to access our archive, if you're running MetView at ECMWF, then you get direct Mars access. If you're running outside ECMWF, then it goes through the web API, which may give you slower retrievals. MetView's mature software version 1.0 came out in 1993, and it's still under active development. It's open source, and it's a cooperation project with the Brazilian Space Institute, INPE. So, just to give you a little taste of what it looks like before we get into the uh, graphical styling of it, if you have a grip file somewhere and you want to make use of it in MetView, then one way is to simply copy your file into MetView space. So inside dollar home slash MetView, um, you can create any number of folders for MetView to use. If we bring up a command line here, we can have a look in our home directory and see that we have a nice geopotential grip file. So if we just copy that into our MetView folder that we've created, then go back into MetView, we will see a grip icon is now ready to use. And for MetView, you can also create symbolic links to files and folders. And if you're writing scripts, then of course you can reference files that are located anywhere on your file system. Next thing is our Mars retrieval icon. Also shows you how to create an icon in MetView. So if we right click on the desktop and say create new icon, we can search the list of available icons, find a Mars retrieval, and then edit the icon. We will see the list of all the possible Mars parameters that we have for locating data in Mars. We'll change the parameter to T for temperature and choose a specific set of atmospheric levels. When we execute that, the text goes green, which means we have the data. And now we can examine that and see that we have what we expected to get. OK, so the next thing is MetView's interactive visualization tool. So we've got a grid file here. And we just want to right click, visualize, and we get a default visualization with no real color to it. We'll come to that in a moment. The sidebar gives us access to the different fields. We can animate through those. We can zoom in and out of different areas. And when you do that, you also get more detail when you when you go in as well. We can increase magnification of small text labels and the details that we want to see. And we've also got a tool for showing the point values underneath the mouse cursor. So this is a nice interactive data inspection tool. And the sidebar also gives us access to various metadata, statistics, and histograms.
Okay, so the next concept in MetView is that of visual definition icons. So these are icons which control all the different aspects of how your plot looks. You can change how the coastlines looks, you can customize your legend, and change the title, add annotations, change how the contouring looks, change how, symbol, how symbols are plotted. So a quick example, we will create a new coastlines icon and shade the land masses in green. So we create the icon here, and when we edit this, we get a custom editor. We can switch land shade on, and we can change the color of green to something a bit less harsh than the default. Visualize the data and drop our coastlines icon into the plot. So that's kind of that's your interactive workflow with, with MedView. Um, creating icons, dropping them into, into plots. Um, now, of course, everything that you can do with icons, you can also do with scripts. Um, I'm concentrating mainly on the icons here, just because it provides maybe a little more visual appeal, and also the icons tell you exactly what options are available. So you can use Python for scripting, or MetView's built-in language macro. They basically offer the same functionality, um, but if you use Python, then of course you, you can import other Python libraries um, and interact with them as well. So of course, if you if you start scripting things, then that gives you much more flexibility than you have with a user interface. Um, and also, if you if you listen in on the post processing webinar. Uh, which Chandra will give, then you'll also see what other sort of functionality you, you get with the scripting. And we have a direct relationship between the icons and the scripts. So this next example here shows if you have something generated with icons, how uh, you can quickly make a script from it. So we're going to create a new Python script. If we edit that, See, MetView has helpfully put the import statement at the start for us. And we can drop our grip icon in and our coastlines icon. And the code editor has generated the relevant Python code. And now we add a plot command. We plot the coastlines in the background. And on top of that, we plot our geopotential grip file. And we run that Python script. We get our plot back. And if we had more data, we could also add those to the plot command and you end up with multiple data layers. So probably more interest than the background is the styling of the data itself. So we have a contouring icon for this. Um, this gives us access to EC chart styles directly, or we can completely create our own uh, color schemes and use, we can select our, our plotting algorithms, uh, which I'll come to in a moment. And like the coastline icon, you just drop the contouring icon into the plot window or add it to your plot command in your script. So first of all, we have this contour automatic setting parameter in the contour icon. If we set that to ECMWF, and drop that into our plot, then MetView will query the metadata of the grid or net CDF data, in fact, and choose the default predefined EC chart style for that data. If you want to select the style yourself, you can change this to style name, and you get this interface here, which lets you uh, filter um, and select whichever EC chart style you want from your data. If you want something a bit more customized, then you have complete control. If you deactivate the automatic setting, 
switch that to off, then you'll find lots more parameters become available to you. So you can change things like the isoline style, color, labeling, the shading parameters, um, how the color schemes are computed. You can add uh, grid point locations to your plot. So here's a fairly basic one to start with. By default, MetView will try and split your data into 10 data bins, as it were, roughly. It tries to give nice numbers, um, so you might not get exactly 10, but you, you can customize that. And here we have asked for the maximum value to be mapped to red and the minimum value to be mapped to blue. And the interpolation of the colors will go clockwise around this HSL wheel that you see on the top right. So it'll go from blue through to light blue, to green, yellow, orange, red. And if you look at the legend, you'll see that's exactly what you get. So if we want to add a bit more detail very easily to that, we simply increase the contour level count to 20. Again, you would just drop that icon into the plot, or you can also edit these um, directly from the plot window too. So now we see that we've got 20 intervals. Now the ISO lines are starting to become a bit distracting. So we can switch those off by setting contour off, and then the ISO lines disappear. By the way, these little blue arrows on the left are simply revert buttons. Um, if you see one of those beside the parameter name, then it means that you've changed it from its default. And if you click that blue arrow, then it will go back to its default. OK, so different ways of specifying the list of colors. So we have four different possibilities. We set the contour shade color method parameter. <clears throat> so, so far we've used calculate. Calculate is where you give a minimum and maximum color. We can take that a little bit further. We set the parameter to gradients. Now, instead of setting just a minimum and maximum, we can set any number of waypoint colors, as you see in the editor here. And MetView will generate color gradients between each pair of color waypoints. Um, and you can also choose how the color interpolation is done if you, if you choose this method. So this gives you a bit more flexibility without having to specify too much yourself. If you do want complete flexibility, then MetView also has a built-in color list editor. So if you set contour shade color method list, then you can simply choose any number of colors yourself, a completely self-defined palette. I created this one the other day. It took about a minute. Um, so it's not very scientific, but it's, it's quite easy to do. And a sort of nice halfway house is to choose one of our predefined palettes. So if you set this parameter to palette, then the contour editor will give you a list of all the available palettes. And they all have the number of colors contained in them as part of their name, which is very useful. So this one here has got 11 colors, which means you can define a list of um, 11 values to, to map to those colors. OK, so now let's get into some of these the filling algorithms and when you might choose uh, specific ones. So we're doing polygon shading just now. And by default, or not by default actually, but the, usually the, the most commonly used uh, filling algorithm is area fill. This just has a flood fill of each um, value range. We can also ask for dot fill which also allows you to specify different densities of dots for different value ranges. 
and we can choose hatch shading as well. So those last two ones can be useful if you have need for a black and white plot, for instance, where you want to rely not just on the color, but have some more um, pattern-based um, indication of the, of the value range. Um, and also they can provide a sort of semi-transparent effect, so you can still see the data underneath them if you have multiple layers uh, without altering the look of the layers underneath. Matthew does allow you to use alpha channels so you can have transparency. Um, but of course, if you have a transparent layer on top of another one, then it can change the look of the underlying field. Okay, now this, one, this one's quite interesting. So contour shade technique, we've used polygon shading so far. This is very nice for continuous fields. This is doing quite a lot of interpolation and smoothing to give you something that looks nice and give you a good impression of the sort of flow of, of values. We can go to the direct opposite of that almost and choose grid shading. So grid shading is showing you the actual data values. These are the grid boxes themselves. Um, so those two plots are taken from the same data. And you can see just how much smoothing the polygon shading is, is actually doing there. So it's managed to derive that nice smooth field from what's actually fairly low resolution data in this case. But if you really want to see the truth of the data, then uh, you can choose grid shading. Cell shading fits somewhere in between the two. Um, it looks quite like grid shading, but you can choose how many cells are displayed per centimeter. So it's more of a, a graphical desire for how many points you want. Um, so for fields which have more sharp transitions, for the polygon shading might overshoot a little bit. A cell shading is good. It can also be quite a nice one to use for fields such as um, simulated and actual satellite imagery. Um, it makes it look more like a photograph um, without the same sort of interpolation artifacts that you would get from the polygon shading. And we also have marker shading. So this plots one marker at each grid point location. And in addition to these, you can always switch the grid value on. And you can choose between having a, a position marker and the value or both. Okay, just a note about wind. So Matthew had a built-in database of parameters that pair together as um, vectors. So for example, 10 meter U and V wind components. So these are plotted as, as uh, vectors and the wind plotting icon gives you the, the customization you need there. So wind field type sets to arrows gives you this sort of plot here. You can also choose to color by wind speed. You can choose the classic wind flags as well. And you can choose to uh, plot streamlines. So these are different ways of plotting wind data, all selectable from the wind plotting icon. If you do have fields which might you not recognize as vector pairs, you can use the grid vectors icon um, to pair them together basically, and then Metview will know that they are to be plotted as um, the wind field or vector field. And the last thing I want to say about grid data is that we also have an icon called EC charts, which not only returns the styling of a particular EC charts layer, 
but can also return the data. So if you have a, if you've seen a nice easy charts layer you want, or you want to see it for past data or for experimental data, then you can use this icon to get the data and the style together. <clears throat> Okay, so now just a word about buffer plotting. The buffer is a very flexible format. Um, can be used or abused for anything. <coughs> Excuse me. It's designed to store conventional observations, and as long as um, as long as it follows certain standard templates, then we can plot these directly. As this example shows some. Um, sign up data, and we can use the observation plotting icon to set some parameters, such as the, the thinning and, and the size of the observations. Scattered data comes in various different formats, so it could come from a CSV file, <coughs> excuse me, or a list of values in a script. ODP or NetCDF data. Also GeoPoints, which is this format on the right. This is Metview's own um, text-based format for scattered geographical data. It's quite simple. If you can get your data into that format, then Metview can do quite a lot with it. So once you have this sort of scattered data, you use the simple plotting icon to change the styling. So here's an example where we set symbol type to marker, and you can alter the, the size and color of the points according to the values of the data. This one we see used quite a lot. If you set symbol type equals number, then you get the actual values plotted. And we set it to text, then this little script illustrates um, we give some longitude and latitude values. And then in the msim function, which is the uh, Python equivalent of the symbol plotting icon, you can specify a list of labels. Then when you plot that, you get those labels plotted at those locations. And also if you have um, two data fields, and then you can plot as a wind. That'll work both on a map or on a nice Cartesian view like this, this profile here. Just a couple of comments about NetCDF. It's not our main format here, but it is becoming more popular. <clears throat> Very flexible format, and if you're going to plot NetCDF data with Net NetView, then you should use the NetCDF visualizer icon um, and explain which variables you want to use, uh, which sort of dimension slicing you wish, you wish to use, and then you should get the plot you want. So here's some examples of data. Um, from NetCDF being plotted with MetView. Matrix style data uses the contouring icon. Point data, you would use the symbol plotting icon. This is an example here. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but these are, <coughs> these are wind arrows taken um, from NetCDF data. And you would use the graph plotting icon if you have something that's more like a, a line chart. ODB is a format developed at ECMWF to handle observations and data assimilation. It's used a bit outside ECMWF, but not a lot yet. It's um, you can think of it like a binary version of a CSV file. It has lots of columns of data, <clears throat> so it's effectively scattered data. Um, 
And like NetCDF, you need a visualizer icon where you say which columns you want to use. And you can also filter your data as well. So, okay, excuse me one second while I get a glass of water. Right. So, I just want to say something about geographic views now. So far, we've only seen um, cylindrical projection. Of course, MedView offers much more through the geographic view icon. So here's a little example of how you use this to store sub areas and choose different projections. So here's one we created earlier, and we are just going to set an area definition in here using the little helper widget tool. <clears throat> so we're happy with that, we save it, and then we can visualize that view icon and drop the data and contouring icon into it. Now we've got that sub area stored so we can reuse it. <coughs> Here's one we set to use the mono wide projection. You can see all the different sorted projections in here. You drop that into the plot window. And you get this. This is often used in um, climate plots, from what I've seen. And here's polar stereographic and being able to rotate the Earth around so that 30 degrees is at the center. <coughs> And if you're feeling romantic, then we have that very nice one there. Okay, the other type of view we have are these ones called analysis views. So these are not geographical as such, at least they're not maps. Um, but these perform some extra processing. So it's the same as the geographic view icon. You set up the icon, you visualize it, and you drop your data into it, or you add everything to a plot command. So you've got cross-section, vertical profile, thermodynamic diagrams, average, both zonal and meridional, and Hogmuller. And this example shows how you would use a, a cross-section. So we prepared this icon earlier, and we're just going to change the line through which the cross-section will be computed. Set the endpoints. We've chosen a log axis for our vertical um, axis. So we visualize this icon and we drop our data and our contouring icon. And so the contouring icon you use for cross-sections is exactly the same as the contouring icon you use for maps. You can reuse them between both types of plot. Cartesian view is for everything else. So generally it, it does not perform any processing of your data, you give it x and y axes and you can get time series or scatter plot out of it. Um, it does also have a mode where you can plot tailored diagrams as well. That's usually used in, in scripting rather than interactively. And then once you have all these views, 
we have an icon called the display window, which is a container for as many views as you want to be put together. So in this example, on the left hand side, you see the display window editor. We've asked for a geographical view on the top and the Cartesian view on the bottom. And then we had a script which plotted uh, a cyclone track, <coughs> excuse me, on the top um, and plotted the minimum sea level pressure on the bottom. And that's available in one of our courses actually. That brings me nicely onto this example. So all these plots here come from an open IFS workshop that was held in 2016. Um, it was looking at ensemble data and Metview was used for processing and, and visualizing the, the fields that came out of the model. And what we see on the left hand side is called a stamp plot. So we have one little map for each ensemble member. Again, this is the sort of thing you would script rather than trying to um, create interactively in, in the user interface. Also shows some other nice examples of visualizing ensemble data. So up here in the top right, we have plumes, basically a, a time series where you have one line for each ensemble member. And of course you can see as time goes on, they diverge more from each other. And down here towards the bottom, we have a so-called spaghetti plot where you choose one, um, one value to draw an ISO line and you draw it for each ensemble member. And again, as, as time progresses from the start of the forecast, uh, you get a, a messier and messier looking plot that looks more like spaghetti. So on our web pages, we have this little online training course, data analysis and visualization using Metview. It has got a little section on how to produce plots from ensemble data. Okay, so that's the main sort of interactive part. I just want to say a few things about scripting. So the original scripting language in Metview was called Macro. It gives access to everything you can do interactively, plus lots more. As you can see in the right hand side here, we have lots more functions that we don't we don't expose through the user interface. Um, so most of Metview's documentation is geared towards this macro language. But um, for, over the last couple of years, we've added this Python interface as well, which also gives you access to all of these functions. Plus it has the advantage of everything that Python gives you. And I'll, I'll show you some examples. Scripting is a good opportunity to talk about output formats. Um, so here we have a little example in a Jupyter notebook. The set output function is the key thing here. If we set this to Jupyter, then when we call the plot command, the resulting plot um, becomes an inline plot in the Jupyter notebook. But we can also use this other syntax here and we can produce uh, files like PostScript, PDF, PNG, SVG, or KML files or we can send them to the interactive plot window as well. And this leads to a very nice example about how you might create an animation. So while Metview does not directly give you an animated file, if you plot a field set which has multiple fields, then depending on the output format, you will get something different. If you plot to PostScript or PDF, then you'll get a multi-page output file, one page per field. And if you plot to these other formats like PNG, you'll get like one PNG per 
uh, per field. So in this little Python example here, we use MetView to read our grid file, which has, I think, five fields in it. We set the output to a Postscript file called plot.ps. The .ps will be added automatically. Call the plot command without any visual styling, so we just get the default plot for that. And then we use um, effectively calling from the command line the image magics convert function. Um, give a little bit of a delay between the frames, make sure it's landscape. Plot.ps is the input, plot.gif is the output, and you get an animated GIF that you see in this in this slide. So I'll just say things about other plotting packages, because of course other plotting packages are available. So one thing you can do with MetView quite easily is to export grid data into an X array. Um, so MetView is using the CF grid Python package underneath, which was developed by ESIMWF and Beoven. Or you can use the CF grid package directly to convert from grid to X array. So this example here uses MetView to read our grid file. And then it creates a data set from just the first field to make it simpler. And then the rest of the code here is um, matplotlib and carter pi. And then you see the plot that you get there. And there's an expert in using these packages. Um, but if you if you are, then you might want to use this, this feature. And then from scattered data, we can easily um, create a pandas data frame. So this example here actually shows a little bit of processing as well. We read a buffer file. We use MetView's observation filter to extract just the air temperature, um, two meter air temperature readings. And it comes out as a geopoint variable. And then on that, we can call MetView's to data frame function, get a pandas data frame, and then pandas gives you some nice simple functions to produce um, easy scatter plots, for instance. MetView does not directly produce 3D plots, but it can interface with two different 3D packages. So if you have either Vapor or Met3D installed, and you know how to use them, because it's, it's not straightforward to use 3D packages usually. Then you can also use MetView to prepare input data for them and to launch them. So we certainly have people here who really work a lot inside the MetView environment. And it's very convenient for them to not have to leave the MetView environment to launch these applications uh, to get a 3D look at their data. And I just want to sort of advertise our, our documentation here. So we've got a, um, on our web page, we've got a big gallery of examples. Um, I think for all the examples, we've got macro and Python code. We've got a selection of Jupyter notebooks, um, which you also want to add to in the coming months. And we've got uh, written tutorials that you can follow. Um, this one here that you see, data analysis and visualization using MetView. If you've got a spare two days roughly, then you can you can go through that and really learn a lot about MetView, both visualization and uh, data processing. Just a note about availability of MetView. So if you're running on a, an ECMWF system like ECGate, then uh, MetView is installed for you there. If you have your own system, then we have some like RPMs and, and Debian packages available. Um, very recently, we added MetView to Conda Forge. Um, we also have the um, source code available so you can build it yourself. And just a note to say that the 
Python layer is an extra install on top of the binaries. So you have to pip install netview. And so for more information, we've got a software support um, email address, and we try to have as much information as we can on the web pages, including an FAQ. And feel free to ask us questions. And feel free to ask us questions now, because we've still got some time. So if you want to put anything into the chat, then um, Chandra is here as well. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. So I'm going to stop sharing this presentation and um, we can look at the chat. Um, but if there aren't any questions, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this and listening. Um, and a small advert for tomorrow's webinar, uh, which is about post-processing. So thank you very much. Any questions? Um, right, first I'll tackle the easy questions first. Um, the slides will be made available. Um, I'd also like to make a couple of troops or notebooks as well if I have time. Um, <coughs> giving the, the code for these um, examples. Um, okay, question about ocean currents as pair of the wave model. Um, I'm not sure about that specific one. We do have the wave parameters that are, um, that are recognized by MetView. I'm not sure about OCU, OCV specifically, but if it's not recognized, then you can use the grid vectors icon. Um, there's, a, there's a slide about that about halfway through. Um, so use the grid vectors icon to uh, tell it that these are a pair of uh, vectors. Um, question about using MetView getting data from a WMS service um, and about using MetView as a WMS itself. So <clears throat> MetView does have a WMS icon. So um, in the, and it, we've got an editor there. So from, the, from our WMS icon, you can specify the URL of the WMS server. Um, and you get a, a dialogue which shows you the available layers. Um, so you can set that up and you can you can visualize that and you can use that as a, as a background to your plots. So that's an obvious example is say using the, the blue marble as a background to your, to your plots to make it look nice. So yes, we can, we can use MetView as a WMS client. MetView is not a WMS server, but we we are we're we're actually we're, we're investigating um, some uh, some new technology, but so it, it may become a WMS server in the future. But at the moment, it's not. Um, So those are good questions, and thank you for your for your kind comments as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised that people like the link with Python as well. I think it was a very good decision to do a Python interface for MetView. Um, we've seen quite a few new users as a result of, of having that. It really opens up the, the uh, scripting world. Any other questions? What kind of file format does MetView support? Um, so as input files, we, um, I hope I remember everything, um, we accept GRIB and NetCDF and ODB and CSV and different variants of CSV files, um, GeoPoints, which is our own format, 
Um, I mean, you can also script it to read any sort of text file. Buffer files. Um, so I think I think that's it. Um, also, if you're using the Python interface, then if you, um, you can also even create some of these formats in memory, as it were, um, if you can pass us some NumPy arrays. Um, is there a forum for help and questions from other users? Strangely enough, we we don't really have that actually. Um, so what we do have is our confluence pages and an FAQ, and we're looking at possibly making a knowledge base out of that. Um, but we don't really have any official forum for users. Um, that's, a, that's a good question, though, and I'll, I'll take that as, as good input. Um, NetCDF visualization is quite cumbersome. It would help out to have a tutorial on that. Um, you know, I, I sort of agree, actually. It's, um, it, it can be cumbersome. Um, so we, we have some information on that in our um, data analysis and visualization training course. Um, if you sort of find your way into data part two, if I remember correctly, then um, that gives some information on handling that CDF data. Um, we do have separate tutorials on, on things like Buffer and ODB, but we don't have a separate thing specifically on NetCDF. So I think that would be quite nice. We're in the process of upgrading our documentation just now. Um, and so adding a sort of NetCDF landing page, as it were, that shows you all the, all the things you can do with NetCDF. I, I agree, we could do with some more examples, especially since NetCDF files can be quite uh, variable. You know, they can have the, scattered data or printed data, um, any number of dimensions. So you need to be careful with it. Okay, I hope I didn't miss any questions. Um, I shall type a little thank you. Talk was fairly heavy on, on, on MetView, but it seemed to make um, sense in the, in the context of what's available to most people. Um, the Python link really opens up the scope to um, ingesting our data and getting into the Python environment. Okay, so I think I'm going to call it a day there. Thank you very much, and I hope you all um, have fun. Uh, visualizing ECMWF's data. Bye-bye.